Oh damn! Vinyl Collection Part 30 within this series. Going to finish up the M's and start the ends within this part. The only other thing I want to briefly talk about quickly is in my previous video, which was the mystery of Seeds of Iblis. A lot of you guys really enjoyed it, which I'm happy to hear because for future video ideas, I, I want to have more videos pertaining to going like into this super nerdy kind of like deep dive of information on uh, specific bands, so definitely keep that in mind as I continue on making videos I want to do more of that type of uh, style. Other than that, what's going to be playing in the background is the debut full length by Slave House, Taste in Pain. Just really savage, harsh, straight to the point, black punk that is just so ass kicking. It was put out through Fallen Empire when they used to be around, so rip to them. And if you just like nothing fancy, straight to the point, harsh black punk, as I just stated, definitely check this out. Starting off part 30 is going to be the last record within my collection that starts with M's, and then we move on to N. And that would be the last demo by Mystic. In the previous part, I was only able to show two of the three that I own, and obviously in this part we get to finish it up with this one. And this is my personal favorite within the Mystic discography. For a quick refresher for some of you guys, Mystic, all done by Swarty the Puth, who's a part of the Ancient Record Bands, and I've always said that his best project is as Alyssa Sath. But a close second is definitely Mystic, as this is just really high energy, explosive, atmospheric black metal. And I can't pronounce any of these song titles to save my life, because it's all in, I'm um, pretty sure, Swiss. But um, track number four on here, that song alone is worth getting this record. It's just so fun to listen to. It's probably the song I replay the most on this release. And while this is a first press, it's really nothing to brag about, as the layout packaging is insanely bare bones. The jacket itself is really flimsy. Single uh, LP that's uh, pretty thin too. Thankfully though, Amorphite recently did represses for this, so if you want to get this um, demo right here on vinyl, go to Amorphite, and I'm pretty sure the quality in terms of the layout and packaging is far superior to this. But yeah, if you're just in the mood for a high energy explosive atmospheric black metal, I strongly recommend you check out this release. At this point, we've entered the ends within my vinyl collection. Kicking it off is going to be the debut full length by Nadra. These guys are an Icelandic black metal band that I remember around the time of 2015 and 2016, Icelandic black metal bands were getting so much appraise. And while they are really good, I think what helped out with their success is that if you enjoyed one of them, you'll enjoy the whole scene itself, mainly because a lot of these bands share members. Nadra, Sinmara, Misthurming, Zrine, and um, I always forget the, the other ones that's such a weird name as us. Uh, Savar I Doubt I'm pretty sure is the right way to say it. I'm pretty sure all these bands share at least one or two people. And if you're familiar with one of the bands and enjoy it, this sounds really similar, as it has like a mixture of like this claustrophobic, arcane, ritualistic vibe of um, atmospheric black metal, and it's just overall really solid. I'm pretty sure after this uh, release right here by Nacho, they had a few more others that I never got around to checking out. But if they're anything as good as this, um, I'm definitely up for uh, listening to it because this is just really solid black metal overall. That um, bit rough around the edges with its raw production value, but again, gives off like that really kind of like eerie, ritualistic sound with a bit of kick to it. But uh, this was put out through Fallen Empire. I'm not really sure where you can get this other than maybe Discog still carries copies of it, so uh, go there if you want to score a copy. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with track listing and band photo. Comes on a printed inner sleeve of credits on one side and a band photo collage on the other. This LP pressing does come on kind of like a grayish marbled color limited to 300 copies. It also did include um, incense sticks, but sadly I don't have them anymore as my bitch of a bimbo ex-girlfriend decided to use them up just randomly without my permission. Up next is what I would consider one of the greatest albums ever made as it's super creative and boundary pushing that I really never thought this could be possible of being done. And I know that's an insanely bold statement to say, but if you guys know of this release, it's really hard to dismiss such a claim. 
and it's John Zorn's Naked City. <sighs> to put it lightly, John Zorn is a madman of a musician. If you look at his body of work from all the solo projects, uh, bands, and guest spots that he's been a part of, it's just so fucking massive, and I can't emphasize that enough, that if you were to listen to a new release within his uh, body of work every day for a month, you wouldn't even have scratched the surface of his discography. Like, it's insane just the labyrinth of music this guy has made within his career and life. And for a lot of people, Naked City is kind of like the fan favorite for the most part, as it's a blend of free jazz, which is usually the uh, genre John Zorn gravitates towards with his songwriting. And I don't know if it was intentional or not, because I feel like it kind of was, because he also had another project, I'm pretty sure, called Painkiller that was signed to a... Uh, earache that it borderlines on grindcore to a certain extent and I don't again I don't know if that was intentional because the free jazz that's played here all done with the saxophone, the guitar, keyboards, bass and drums it's just played so frantic and aggressively that it sounds like a grindcore band and it's just so fucking incredible tracks in here like Batman, uh, you get you will you will be shot, uh, I want to live um, what's another good one? A Shot in the Dark is my personal favorite song on here, along with, uh, what's some other good ones? Fuck the Facts, which is that uh, grindcore band took the name of their name from this album. Blood Duster, Hammerhead, just, it's just all so incredible how a jazz band sounds like a grindcore band, that there's never a dull moment at any point within this album, and it's something that I feel like it needs to be heard by metal fans, just to showcase of them just the creativity of jazz music like John Zorn is the jazz artist for metal fans to put it in short and it's a must listen release overall and I was really lucky to score this copy off at Discogs for retail price because now um, it goes for just such dumb money and this is the 2016 repress so hopefully they do another repress soon because it's just in high demand the LPs of Naked City but as for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork right here, which is I'm pretty sure an actual um, photo of an actual murder scene, which is pretty cool. Backside with credits and track listings, and just comes on a standard black vinyl. Then I have the debut full length by Natranar. This is a one-man black metal project that I'm pretty sure is based out of Sweden. Please correct me on that if I'm wrong. And how I got familiar with this um, album right here was I had a friend who was living in Salem at the time, and I hung out with him for a bit, met up with him in Salem, and we were talking about music, and one of the releases that he brought up to me was uh, Natranar, and he was like, oh, I know you love Black Metal, Wyatt. This is one of the best Black Metal releases of this year, probably even album of the year for me personally. It's just so good, you gotta check it out. Taking his word on it, I scored a copy of this record on Amorphity, which I'm pretty sure they're still available on that distro. And when I finally got done listening to it, I was just really confused because all this really is is just an okay black metal release. Like, the best way to describe it is uh, think of the songwriting of Fortress, where it has that really grand, triumphant, emotive sound attached with them that has, like, genuine, true passion, I feel like. Strip that away from Fortress, and all that's left is something that would sound like Natranar. Like, yeah, it's really, like, heavily uh, tremolo-picked riffs with the components that you're familiar with, with black metal, the screechy vocals, kind of like harsh atmospheric production, but it's not really doing anything out of the ordinary that you could hear from, like, you know, the rest of the bunch. So it's just, again, an okay release at best. And I've, I haven't spun this in such a long time that I honestly forgot I own this until picking it out of the... Uh, the shelves to do this video, so yeah, not much else needs to be said, I feel like, about this. As for the lay on packaging, however, you have album artwork that's spot gloss to shit, backside with the track listing, comes with an insert sheet with lyrics, along with an A2 poster that honestly looks really killer, and is just on a standard black vinyl. Oh boy, the next record is such a banger, and that would be Naked Whipper, Pain Streaks. It mildly depresses me to a certain extent that there are so many extreme metal fans that I know of and so, so few of them know who Naked Whipper is. Like, that needs to change immediately. 
Because Naked Whipper, it's considered sado grind metal is what they called it when they started out. But it's more in line to like the war metal bands of again like the Blasphemy, Revenge, Black Witchery, you know, stuff like that. But this shit is just so much more fun. I can not emphasize that enough. The best way to describe it is think of every war metal band that you can think of, and they're at a party. And every war metal band just seems too cool and tough to actually party with people. Like they're just sitting and standing in the back walls just like looking at everything happening. Naked Whipper would be the guy partying with everyone who's like super buff with the sunglasses. Like that's the best way I can describe Naked Whipper because it's just such an edge of fun with them. Because the opening track on this release is called <laughs> Pagan Pussy Gore Intruder. That song alone should just give you the vibe of what this is going to sound like. And it's just, again, it's so fucking fun. I love this release. It just has such a replay value. It never gets sickening. And this is coming from someone who really doesn't like these kind of like war metal bands. Naked Whipper is just such a standout because it's just actually fun, right? And it sucks that um, this is a compilation of everything they've ever done. Like... Everything back here, that's it. That's their discography right there. Pretty sure they've only done three individual uh, releases in their whole entirety within their discogs. And then they split up. And there's a lot of mystery as to why. I know someone told me recently that the uh, vocalist slash guitarist of this band uh, went to jail. <laughs> he didn't explain for what exactly, but that's what, maybe one of the reasons. I don't know, I can't find any information about it, but what they left for us all compiled in this um, compilation right here that's put up through Death Rune Records, where that's where you can still get um, copies of this. Again, I know I'm repeating myself, it's so fucking fun that it's, again, it's a must listen. But anyway, as for the layout and packaging with this, you have album artwork. Backside with all the track listings and credits comes with an insert sheet one side has the credits other side is of the artwork for one of their seven inches called a mulch acid orgy also includes an a2 poster of the album artwork along with band logo and all vinyl copies come on semi-translucent blood red vinyl damn I gotta admit this part has a lot of bangers because the next record is arguably a masterpiece by definition and so many people who enjoy this style of music appraise this record to just such a high degree and it deserves every bit of positivity that it gets. And that would be Nature and Organization, Beauty Reaps the Blood of Solitude. For a lot of people this is the be-all, end-all Neil Folk album ever made as it has David Tibet from Current 93, Douglas Pierce from Death in June, Michael Cashmore doing all, like, all the compositional work for it, along with a lot of other really respected and talented individuals within the folk and neo-folk scene come together here, and it's truly a work of art. How all the stringed instrumentation just flows together seamlessly of the guitars, violin, and cello, to the singing done by either David Tibet, Douglas Pierce, or Rose McDowall, and it's just absolutely breathtaking how every nanosecond of this album just feels like you're going to be so immersed within it. It's dark, moody, artistic, but just feels so immersive at the same time. Tracks on here like Wicker Man's song, Beauty Destroyed, which is my personal favorite, Tears from an Eastern Girl, My Black Diary, and um, Blood of Solitude Part 2. It's just... Oh, man, I, I really don't know how you can say anything negative about this album. It's truly a 10 out of 10 perfect, flawless masterpiece of neo-folk that, uh, again, it deserves every bit of positivity that it gets here on the internet. I feel like anyone who enjoys neo-folk, when you bring up this album to the individual, they will stop whatever they're doing and just appraise the living hell out of it. So, if you want to get into this style of music, this is one of the best places to start off with, with nature and organization. And I'm really lucky that I'm even holding a copy of this because, amazingly, on Discogs, someone was selling it for a reasonable price. Like, yeah, it was still inflated, but compared to what it goes for now, really lucky and um, they're really hard to come by nowadays. But yeah, the layout and packaging for this is glorious. So you have 
Almart work, backside with the track listing, comes on a gatefold, and I just absolutely love the pictures inside of it. Comes on a standard black vinyl, but it does have a printed inner sleeve, one with the lyrics. Other side with credits, signed by Michael Kazmore, and it's limited to 500 copies. I got number 82 out of 500. Going down memory lane with this record right here, next up is Nabla Viscaris, Portal of Eye. These guys are an Australian extreme metal band that blend a lot of progressive music and songwriting with their style that's usually awfully compared to stuff like Opeth and his son, but just more extreme metal driven. But I would say it's more in line with bands like Emperor with their you know middle portion of their discography blending symphonic and neoclassical elements within extreme metal. And though I've lost a bit of interest with these guys over the years with the whole like Patreon crowdfunding thing that was just basically, hey, give us money and we might tour around your area because we don't know how to spend it wisely while we're on tour. And their third album, which was pretty underwhelming in my personal view, I've just lost interest with them. But their first two full lengths I still find to be very, very enjoyable. The song on this album, In Plague Flowers the Kaleidoscope, is so incredible. Every portion of that song, I absolutely love it. And I still replay this album just for that song alone. It's incredible. Um, other than that, I will say, I think what piqued my interest with just the violin as a whole, regardless if I'm trying to learn it by fucking reading music theory about it, or just listening to it, um through my speakers, is that the violin, done by Tim Charles on this band, but just in general, it's just such a sharp instrument that no matter what's happening around it, regardless of genre, it will always cut through the sound and my attention just immediately goes to the violin. And I think that's what really sold me on Nea Blaviscaris when I discovered them, like God, five or six years ago. But yeah, overall a really solid album that I still replay because their first two are where it's at in their discography. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with track listings. This is a first press done and put out through Welkin Records. And it's just a double LP on plain black vinyl. Which of course leads to their sophomore full length, Citadel. It's the album that I put for album of the year in 2014. And while I still enjoy it a lot for what it is, I wouldn't hold it to the degree that I did seven years ago as, I know I would say it's like one of the greatest albums ever, 10 out of 10, it's perfection. It's just, I don't know, maybe over the years I've lost a bit of love for it because of how many times I've listened to it. But songs on here like Painters of the Tempest Part 2 and Devour Me Colossus Part 1, I still think are really enjoyable, even though they run for... 12 and 16 minutes long they're still very entertaining but yeah this was around the time where my interest and appraise for them peaked because i bought it a second time just so they could sign the record as you can see it's all signed by the members during this time of like uh 2015 is when i saw them i'm pretty sure and that was pretty cool but other than that i mean if you're in the mood for like extreme metal that blends like somewhat classical music together, it's definitely worth checking out and that's really about it for what I can say for it. As for the lay on packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings and more artwork. It comes on a standard black vinyl but does have a printed inner sleeve with lyrics on one side and credits on the other. Proceeding on to Necromantia with their demo from 1993. I scored a copy of this at Armageddon and it was only 10 bucks and it was before I knew who Necromantia actually was. And the thing that sold me about it was that it's a 12 inch record and it's only 10 bucks so I figured why the fuck not. And realizing who they were and doing some research about them I came to the conclusion that Necromantia, they're one of the big boys when it comes to Greek black metal. I feel like if you have a discussion about Greek black metal with anyone, Necromantia is a mandatory band to talk about, as they're arguably one of the first ever black metal bands formed out of Greece. 
because uh, the three big ones are Necromantia, Barathorn, and Rotting Christ. And easily out of the three, Necromantia obliterates the other two. And even for their demo, this stuff is still really savage and wicked sounding because what separates them from the rest of the pack that's quite interesting is whereas most black metal bands have either like two guitarists and you know a bassist, vocalist, drummer, Necromantia had two bassists and one guitarist, and one of the bass players who does the vocals and he was like the mastermind behind it, who was Baron Blood, who sadly passed away back in 2019. Most of the riffs you're hearing out of this that you'll find to be really good are all done by an eight-string bass. Like, who the fuck was doing that with black metal during the 90s? That's what makes Necromantia just such a standout and such a respected name. And again, even for a demo, this shit fucking kills. So, definitely worth the blind buy and worth the ten bucks I got it for during that time. But other than that, I'm pretty sure this is easy to get online. I see copies on Discogs floating around for, again, around the same price, so definitely check it out when you can. But as for the layout and packaging, it's pretty bare bones. Yeah, album artwork, backside with track listings and band logo. And one thing I find funny on the back, it says, God is dead. We killed him. <laughs> if that doesn't scream early 90s black metal, I don't know what does. It also includes an inner sheet with lyrics on one side band photo on the other, along with a mini poster of the artwork and band logo and just comes on a standard black vinyl. The only other record I have by Necromantia at the moment is their legendary sophomore full-length album, that being Scarlet Evil Witching Black. Man, this album slays so hard even after 25 years of its existence. This is a mandatory muscle listen I feel like for all black metal fans. Because, again, what's just such a standout about them, as I stated before, that a lot of the riffs that you're going to admire with this album is all done by Blood Baron, who played an eight-string bass guitar. Then on top of it, too, it just has, like, that genuine, badass, evil sound to it, because there's a lot of keyboard work on here that really propels the melodies to a really sinister sound. And then finally, the thing that really makes it quite the standout for a black metal record that was done in the mid-90s, which was just unheard of, is there's a bit of experimentation as there's a saxophone solo in the middle portion of this album that it was rare to come by such bands that would give you this genuine evil black metal sound that would also just think out of the box in a few cases with their songwriting. It's just an album that, again, really stands apart from the rest of the pack during the time of the mid-90s for black metal. It's absolutely incredible and just genuinely evil at the same time. So it's a definite must purchase, I feel like, for all and any black metal fans. It was uh, repressed through Osmos Records. I'm pretty sure there's dozens upon dozens of copies available there, along with Hell's Headbangers and stuff of the sort. So there's a lot of distros carrying this record. For the layout packaging, however, you have album artwork, backside with track listings and band logo comes with a big-ass booklet with lyrics and band photos all around, which is pretty neat. And the LP edition I got comes on like this red and gold merge type of color. The French do it better, as I typically say, because next up is Necropole with their debut full-length album. These guys obviously are a French black metal band. Now, I remember when this album dropped, it got a lot of buzz and attention because a lot of people have praised it for the songwriting. And overall, it's just really minimalistic, fast-paced black metal, as there's very few transitions happening, and it's just super stripped down. That reminds me in some aspects of, like, Hate Forest. That's very aggressive, but also trance-inducing at the same time. Necropole is eerily similar to that. That just overall, it's, as I stated, really stripped down. It's just a really strong black metal record, I would say that just oozes a lot of strength and just power while still being minimalistic. And the really basic uh, components of it just make it work so well. That's a black metal record really for black metal fans and that's about it. So really solid stuff and I'd love to see what they would do next after this because simple but effective is I guess their method and it fucking works. 
I got this through Northern Heritage and there's still loads of copies available there along with, again, Nuclear War Now, Hell's Headbangers, uh, Osmos Productions, you know, all the labels that you're accustomed to knowing should still carry copies of it. For the layout and packaging, however, it's insanely bare bones because that's typically how Northern Heritage Records usually does their layout and packaging because you have album artwork, backside with the track listing, standard black vinyl along with an insert sheet with just lyrics on both sides. Nearing the end within this vinyl collection part is going to be Ned Triple X. Uh, this is a ex an extreme metal band, I guess, um, that's signed to Norma Evangelium Diaboli. And I know this label typically has a lot of black metal bands signed to it. And yes, you could say, well, it's a black metal band or an experimental black metal band. There comes a point where it's like, I, I really don't know exactly what this is because... <laughs> Just how everything's being executed and played, it's like, uh, what the fuck is this trying to be? As there's elements of black metal, but it's also insanely technical that it's just something you wouldn't really attach with black metal, how these riffs are played out. Along with the vocals, there's like shouting, clean singing, and then it goes back to like screams right after it. It's a very... <sighs> technical album that just has a lot of abrupt changes without warning. That I feel like if you want, like, Despel Omega or, like, mid-2000s Abigor on cocaine, check out Ned Triple X. It's a wild record that's such an oddball, and I'll just leave it at that description because there's just so much happening within the first five minutes of this record that it might uh, interest some of you guys. But other than that, you can get it on uh, Norma Evangelium Diaboli. There's loads of copies available there. For the layout and packaging, however, you have album artwork. Backside with just the label logo. Comes on a standard black vinyl along with an insert sheet paper of just all lyrics inside. The next two records are by a black metal band that's my personal favorite based out of the United States. And that would be Negative Plane with their debut full length album. What I enjoy about these guys so much is that they're able to blend both the styles of first wave black metal and second wave black metal perfectly. How they're able to capture the savage yet thrashy sounds of first wave black metal with the kind of like a cult, evil, atmospheric vibe of second wave black metal is just a match made in heaven I feel like when it comes to their songwriting and it just works so well. But for their debut full-length album, I would say it's my least favorite of the two full-lengths as it's a bit rigid for the most part, but still really solid for you know them starting out. And I've been trying to get a copy for the longest time, but finally did on Discogs a few months back, and it's just a collection piece that I've been trying to get and finally did, thankfully. But anyway, as for the layout and packaging with this record, you have album artwork, backside, comes on a gatefold with a band picture of each of the two members, double LP that come on printed inner sleeves, I'm not going to show you both because they're both identical, but this is what they look like with just lyrics on both sides, and as I stated, just on plain black vinyl. Second to last is going to be negative plane again, stained glass revelations, God, I love this record so much. As I stated, they blend first wave black metal and second wave black metal, and this is the one where they really stuck the landing with the songwriting, and everything about it just works so well. I understand the fact when it comes to United States black metal, it does have quite a bit of heavy hitters, you know, like Leviathan, Disaster, Gramble Isles Key, um, Nightbringer, Weakling, Wolves in the Throne Room, Panopticon, and, you know, a lot of names that people have a lot of respect and love for, but for me, Negative Plane, cannot stress it enough, I feel like outdoes them, especially with Stained Glass Revelations, because this is just pure, unadulterated evil throughout this album. And what I feel like really helps out just the overall pacing of this album work so well, is after each track of just, you know, black metal, there's these kind of, like, instrumental interlude tracks that have like these organs and pipes being played 
that it really gets you immersed into the vibe of the album that just makes it seem like this album's being performed in like some really evil underground ceremony that just really indulges the listener even more and it's so good it is such a good record and it's a re there's a reason why it ended up being really high up on my list as my all-time favorite personal black metal records of all time it's in that i think it's like number 11 or something stained glass revelations is a must listen for black metal fans i feel like but other than that um the only other thing i guess to bring up is the layout and packaging so you have album artwork backside not with much just track listings and just the name of the album at the top comes on a double lp all plain black vinyl along with an little booklet that it comes with with just again lyrics and artwork to go along with each track. And the last record for this final collection par is something that I recently acquired about a week ago. And it's a record I've been wanting for the longest time on an LP format, but thankfully my prayers and wishes came true as Death Bomb Arc randomly announced that they were going to do a vinyl press for it and snapped it out without hesitation. And that would be the last record ever done by Nero's Day at Disneyland from Rotting Fantasyland. This is a breakcore project mainly composed by um, Lauren Bosfield. And this is just really upbeat, high energy, flamboyant, wild, wacky, crazy breakcore. And I'll admit, what really piqued my interest to check this project out a, a few years back was just the name of it. Nero's Day at Disneyland? Like, what's, it's such an odd name. And it was the song, I'm pretty sure it's a Child Protective Services theme song is the whole title of it. And I remember just being in such an awe, but in confusion at just how wild the beats were and just how energetic it was at the same time. But then this certain percussion fill came in and instead of it just like connecting it to point A to point B within the beats or ending on like a crashed cymbal type of uh, you know, fill within that uh, percussion fill, it ended with this sound going wah, <laughs> wah, and I remember just laughing so much at it because it was just so fucking odd. And I was listening to it with a friend at a time and we were just both like having just such enjoyment out of that one particular moment and what's funny is about a year after that my friend brings it up again to me he's like hey remember Nero's day at Disneyland and I had a brain fart and I couldn't remember I'm like no I, I, I don't remember he's like yeah come on we both listened to it together and that didn't help because there's a lot of music that um, him and I uh, talk about on you know the regular so I was like no I don't remember it he's like yeah you do and then he said, yeah, remember, it's the record that goes, when <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, that band. That's all he had to say. Like, it's just so odd that the percussion fill ends with a, when But <laughs> I, I love it. Overall, the whole album itself is just a blast to listen to. And I would argue it's a great way to uh, introduce someone to the style of breakcore. As well, too, I'm pretty sure... Um, Lauren Bosfield started its own individual project that's self-titled, and I would love to get some music by um, Lauren uh, Bosfield's side project, but it's more of like a blend of trip-hop and breakcore, and it's really emotional and moody for breakcore, which I would never expect the style to go under, but I would love to score a vinyl copy of that one day. But regardless, sadly, Nero's Day at Disneyland, uh, this record sold out so quickly on Death Bomb Arc, so I'm really fortunate enough I scored a copy myself. But as for the layout and packaging with this album, you have front side of it with the artwork, back side of it of the continuation of said artwork. Comes with a fold-out poster of some really just crazy, trippy artwork. Other side of it is the whole uh, picture of the said artwork. It also comes on a printed inner sleeve, side one, and side two is just all the credits and track listings of the album. And this vinyl pressing comes on like this purple swirl type of color, which looks pretty cool. All right, guys, that'll do it for this vinyl collection part. Like always, links will be provided to everything I talked about in the description below, and that is that. 
So like always guys, make sure you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated and have a great day.